Our next speaker is someone who is also devoted, really, her professional life to epilepsy. Um, and uh, she has been active in, in so many ways with the Epilepsy Foundation. I, I mean, Patty, I don't know how many committees you've been on, but um, and we, a couple. Uh, even the school nurse, the school nurse curriculum she helped design, uh, the one that we're trying to get implemented once we f go through and get more nurses for the state of Michigan, which is something I'll talk to you about later. Uh, Patty Osborne Shaper is an epilepsy nurse specialist and nurse researcher at the Comprehensive Epilepsy Program at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. She's also the associate editor for epilepsy.com and has, and, and has, well, you've done pretty much everything. You've been involved um, in the merger and, and everything. So I, without further ado, I'm going to just ask Patty to, uh, to come on up and talk about current trends in epilepsy research, diagnosis, and treatment, which I know is something we're all real interested in. Thank you. Yeah, here we go. Well, thank you very much for having me come here today. Um, I have so many friends here in Michigan that uh, this is great coming here. Even though I don't come to Michigan, I feel like I'm home again, seeing so many familiar faces. Um, I kind of put this title up here because um, each year the Epilepsy Foundation sponsors a conference that looks at kind of new therapies or progress that's being made in epilepsy research. Every other year we call this conference the kind of new therapy pipeline update. And then on that off year, I think it's... Uh, called, I don't know, AED drug development, um, but it's really been focusing on similar advances. So we had one in San Francisco in June. Um, so my job is really to kind of um, talk to you about what is coming down the line, what might be here, what we may see, you know, soon, what might be coming farther down the road, but more to kind of look at it from our perspective. What does all this stuff mean to us? How will it help each and every one of us here in this room and beyond. So I first want to, um, you know, um, all those things that, you know, Arlene said. But more importantly, I, I, uh, epilepsy's, you know, we say it's a spectrum disorder because no, no two epilepsy experiences are alike. Um, I've lived with epilepsy all my life as well. And, you know, in many respects, I'm a, I'm a lucky one in that as long as I take medications, my seizures have been controlled, you know, but I can never get off them. I, I've tried it, doesn't work. So I know that, that I've tried many a time, doesn't work. So I got to be here with it. Um, I've got a son who developed similar kinds of seizures, and I thought, oh, God, here we go again. But he got one of the newer drugs when he was younger, and by middle school, he was controlled off drugs, and now he's in the Marines. So I'm like, wow, way two different sides of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. But then I've got others in my family, and so one's a, a second cousin, but um, he had similar kinds of partial seizures, very uncontrolled, until he came in and, uh, uh, to an epilepsy center, and he got one of the devices that we're going to be talking about today, and now he's seizure-free. So it's kind of, there are so many different experiences in epilepsy, so that I hope that each and every one of you will kind of pick out some nuggets that are really going to relate to you here and throughout the rest of the day. So during the talk, I want to first start by talking about some changing concepts in our epilepsy language and, and some new things are, that we learn about the causes of epilepsy and then get into some of the other therapies and then how we advocate and participate in this. So what is the epilepsy pipeline? Um, this was started with the Epilepsy Therapy Project uh, to try to pull together all of the information about what's being developed in epilepsy. It includes drugs, devices, dietary, wellness therapies, anything that could be used to help in the treatment of, of people with seizures. The goal of this was to improve our future, you know, to help people be well, to live better lives, and to put an end to seizures and uh, side effects. And this has really become, the, it's been the mission of the Epilepsy Therapy Project, which is now the Epilepsy Foundation, to really help develop new therapies in a time frame that matters. So that means getting them to people here and now and not just in future generations. So this is a concept that had been very hard to kind of grasp. And so we uh, felt that there needed to be some kind of visualization of this. So not only can we understand it when we're talking about it, 
but it also gives visibility to the many people involved. It provides a way of looking at progress. This is on epilepsy.com. This is just a very partial screenshot. But basically what you see is that on this you can track the companies that are manufacturing it, the product or, of, or the device or whatever it is, but then more importantly, what are the sponsors? Who are the different epilepsy organizations have, have fed into this? And then, you know, the orange and blue really helps you see where along the phase of development it is. And this is updated each year so we can see what's happening, and it covers all of the different categories. Now you can say, well, what does this all mean? And so we like to look at the impact of that. And so if you go underneath the pipeline, you'll see down at the bottom 123 different you know, therapies are being tracked on this pipeline, and that is growing each year. And it covers the whole variety. And of course, medications are a, a top one, but you know, people are responding to changes in technology and trying to take things from other diseases and moving it into epilepsy, because how can you deliver drugs better? How can you treat it better with devices? How can we keep safe? How can we improve our diagnosis? If you don't improve diagnosis, people don't get treatment fast enough. So all of these, I think the, the breadth of that is really exciting. Four, 14 of these were marketed in 2013, four of which the Epilepsy Foundation has significant impact on in, in some of the uh, funding for the development of this. And of the total, we helped fund the development of over half of those. So that, I think, is where you say, what's your impact and where are the dollars going and the efforts that everyone in the foundation does? So Phil already highlighted a few. I'm just going to briefly take you through four that the foundation, you know, had a key role in and then move us into some of the other concepts and therapies. So um, he mentioned Visual Ace, which is basically a, a type of laser ablation technology. So how can you, if you find an area of the brain that is causing seizures, instead of opening up the skull and trying to visualize it and put EEG electrodes right on that area, can we make a very small hole in the skull and with an MRI guide in and find that spot, direct a laser to it so it heats up and destroys that area. Benefit is you don't need a big open surgery. Um, you recover sooner. You know, there's a whole host of benefits that way. Downside is you need a very precise, localized area of where the seizures are coming from. And that's not true for a lot of people. So I think it's going to be extremely helpful for many people. Many won't respond to this. But it's a real exciting technology because it tells us what can we do. As I said, it came from brain tumor field. It's now being used in epilepsy. And we're going to see more and more therapies do that. The smartwatch. Instead of just getting rid of seizures, can we keep people safe? Can we track seizures better? Can you get help to someone sooner? That comes from us, from you, to say, I need more than just a medicine or a device. I need to kind of live my life and not be injured in the hospital all the time. Right. Sammy, again, is that video monitor. So again, how can I detect it? How many parents are in the room? How many times have you slept in your child's room? A lot of hands go up. I mean, I see this all the time. So how is your health and wellness? You're probably pretty sleep deprived when you're constantly, you know, wondering what's going on or any movement that happens, worrying about that. So this is for everybody. It's so important for caregivers to say, is there a way we can detect seizures and get an alert from it, but I can still get a good night's sleep? You know, and it, it's so important to improve the health of everybody. And then this trigeminal nerve stimulation. Um, the trigeminal nerve is one of the cranial nerves that, you know, are important in our body and go directly to the brain. And the trigeminal nerve goes and innervates or, or affects the sensation movement of our face, right? So you can say, well, what does the face nerves, you know, or nerves there have to do with seizures? Well, those nerves go into the brain stem and they connect with key areas of the brain stem that actually are involved with the generation of seizures. And they affect, you know, the, the signals from the brain stem up to the key areas of the brain. Similar areas to where vagus nerve stimulation, vagus nerve stimulation has shown its effect. We don't know exactly how it works, but we can see some key areas of brain involved. 
The difference between this and vagus nerve stimulation, it's an external stimulation. So you can put a patch on your forehead, and they're also working on one that's subcutaneously, underneath the skin. So, or actually you have the stimulator device that you can just put on your bedside, or you can have it underneath the skin. And this provides stimulation to the trigeminal nerve, which will go in and stimulate the brain. You don't need to wear it all the time. I understand you can use it just, you know, at, during night. So it's an external way of providing stimulation to a novel target, a new area, and help control seizures. It is not a cure. It's not yet available in the U.S. It's mar being marketed in Canada and the, um, European, in the European countries. But it's similar in results to vagus nerve stimulation that about 50% or more will experience a decrease, a 50% yeah, or more will experience a decrease in seizures. So very promising new therapy. So those were four that I just highlight the, where the Epilepsy Foundation has really had a major impact. And let me now take us back to a little broader view of, of this. And I first want to talk about some changing concepts. The terms epilepsy, seizure disorder, epileptogenesis. I don't know how many of you have heard of epileptogenesis. It's kind of the term that we talk about in the medical field. But um, when you have epilepsy, all epilepsy means is that you have recurring seizures. And the term seizure disorder means the same thing as epilepsy. Right? Unfortunately, so many of us think we have a seizure disorder and not epilepsy. But in fact, it really is the same thing. Right? Unfortunately, many of my colleagues, the healthcare professionals, we're the worst people in thinking that using the word epilepsy is going to be more stigmatizing. So we don't. And we say you have seizures or seizure disorder. But if you have just a seizure disorder, you're not going to go to the Epilepsy Foundation for help. So it's real important that we know what these are. But once you're diagnosed with epilepsy, there's been a process going on in the brain prior to that called epileptogenesis, which is a process in the brain of developing epilepsy. So right now, we use drugs that are called anti-epileptic drugs, or AEDs. We're not actually getting at anti-epilepsy yet. We're getting at trying to stop the seizure. So you'll see some people talking about ASDs, or anti-seizure drugs, because that's kind of really where our therapies have been going on now. And hopefully, in the future, we can try to get it really targeting the epilepsy process, the development of the epilepsy, trying to prevent that in the beginning, because that's the only way we're going to get to a cure. Another key concept is, are we living with a disease or a disorder? Okay. But first, I want to go to, what is epilepsy? In the past couple of years, the International League Against Epilepsy has redefined this epilepsy. It used to be that you had to have at least two or more unprovoked seizures. So it's not provoked by another medical or treatable illness, right? Um, yet what was finding was that that's leaving out a lot of people or actually having a lot of people take the risk of having a second seizure when we kind of knew after the first seizure that they had epilepsy. So there's some kinds of epilepsy that you know by looking at their EEG, they have a very high risk of recurring, and they need to be started on uh, medications right away. Or you know if you look at an MRI scan and you find a, a lesion or certain, you know, um, developmental problem in there, that that's going to require treatment. So why do you wait? Right? So this means getting treatment earlier to people who may need that. So this definition of one unprovoked seizure is for those who have a high risk of recurrence. The definition also includes those with reflex seizures. So reflex seizures, if you think of someone who has um, seizures in response to flashing lights or photosensitive seizures or a host of other kinds of stimuli, they've been in a category that it's actually provoked. So is it epilepsy because it's provoked by something or not? What we know is people need medica medications for it. It's epilepsy. So that's all wrapped into it, as well as it incorporates the epilepsy syndrome. A lot of people are giving terms to say what they have. You have absence seizures. You have um, tuberous sclerosis. You have all these other terms. Well, when in fact, those are just words that define an epilepsy syndrome. It is epilepsy. So that's what that new definition is trying to incorporate. Now, when we talk about the new definition, let's think about the, the whole experience of epilepsy. Is it a disease or a disorder? This also came out of the ILAE saying that it, it's a disease. We need to use that word and not be afraid of that. Well, a lot of people get upset about that because they feel that the term disease 
means you have something that's contagious or can spread, is infectious, and they think that's kind of uh, not the good way to go. Um, or it could be more stigmatizing if you call it a disease. Yet at the same time, a condition you know, or disorder means something's wrong or out of order, so then that could be seen as more stigmatizing. So whichever way you cut it, it's, it's a concern um, from the ground up of kind of what word's most appropriate. So I just went online to Merriam-Webster Online Medical Dictionary, and here's what the terms mean, and it really is the same thing. You know, the disorder is the abnormal physical or mental condition, but to me the disease is what it really is. It's an illness that affects somebody, and it's a condition that prevents your body or mind from functioning normally. So to me, I don't worry as much about the stigmatizing effect of it, because I think when I worry about that, I probably perpetuate stigma. And I've got to think about what it really is and what word's going to get the most attention. If you think about Capitol Hill or funding dollars, if you talk about a disease, like cancer's a disease, they're going to get funding. If we just have a condition, you're not going to get as much funding and attention to it. So that's my word on the disease or disorder term, and we can argue on it at lunch. <laughs> and disability. Well, and is epilepsy a disability? Another huge, huge, huge question. You know, which, yes, it is. So uh, I'm going to touch on this causes slide for a couple things. These are new themes emergence, not necessarily new, but possibly new to some of you. We're learning a lot about the genetics of epilepsy. You know, we're tying some genes to specific types, but more often it's, a, it's what we call a mutation or, or a part of a gene that might have developed or changed and so it's not working the right way, or it, the gene might influence how the body works in general. So it influences the proteins and the enzymes which affect how the brain functions. So it's not necessarily a one gene leads to this. It is all different parts of genes and how it interacts with the brain. And there's not one epilepsy gene. There's tons of things that have all been identified in different things, and a lot we still don't know. The interesting thing is that we're finding that some of the real devastating forms of the epilepsy that people previously thought were totally unknown are being linked to some kind of ge genetic mutation. We're also finding some genes that can help determine responsiveness, you know, to treatment. So I think about that. We haven't really changed the number that about at least 30% of people still don't respond to treatment. That number stayed stable for way too long, even though we've got all these new therapies. So is there something different about some people with, re with uncontrolled refractory seizures or not? And ca if we can find it genetically, will that help us treat it better? Trauma to the brain is a frequent cause. So if we look at the, at the traumatic brain injury literature, what can we find out about what's going on in the brain early after the trauma, and can we intervene then to prevent the development of epilepsy later on? So that kind of gets at more intervening earlier to, develop, to prevent the, the injury that leads to long-lasting epilepsy. A host of other things that go on with TBI that really uh, are important to epilepsy as well. Inflammation. There's, there's a, a number of researchers out there looking at that there's an inflammation or inflammatory process that affects the brain. And if that happens, or when that happens, could we intervene with a drug that decreases the inflammation rather than waiting for the end point symptom of the seizure? And then I also think about the term of comorbid conditions, which is other associated conditions whole host of things that, that, you know, people might have epilepsy alone or they might have epilepsy and other things. We know that between 30, around 30 percent of just people with epilepsy may have um, an associated mood, mood disorder. Um, people with uncontrolled seizures have a, a risk of that of up to 50 percent. So why is that? Well, it shares some similar mechanisms in the brain. And I think what's, I, I'm fascinated by listening to my psychiatry colleagues when they say people with depression have a greater risk of seizures. So what are some of those shared mechanisms, and can we understand how to treat epilepsy better by looking at some of these other disorders? So in the other associated conditions, is it a consequence or a cause of epilepsy? And, or does it matter, and we just need to investigate them anyway? So those are some of the thoughts that, you know, just a few of the thoughts and concepts that, that people are working on right now. So now let's go into some of the therapies and talk about what might be happening. And first of all, don't try to take notes on all these. 
all of the um, uh, sessions at the Pipeline Conference, we had a family day, were um, videotaped. So if you go on to epilepsy.com, you can get to the Epilepsy Foundation YouTube channel. You can pick out certain topics and listen to those as well. And so what I did, having been the chair of that one, I took the liberty of, of taking one of the uh, presentations that Warren Lambert and I had used for his presentation and then pulled some key parts from some of the other presentations to give you the highlights of this. Dan. Okay, so drug therapies. A lot of, this started back in the mid-1840s, and it was a lot of years without making progress. But look what's happened in the last 20 years. A lot of new medications have come forth. But my, my, my point of this slide is that we still have 30% who say they're not well controlled and increase that to 40 to 50% of people who say, well, my seizures might be better, but I'm having intolerable side effects of therapy. Right? So we haven't you know, gotten where we need to be yet. Where should we be? Well, the ideal treatment would be that it's going to work in everybody. So you want it to work in someone with well-controlled seizures as well as refractory or uncontrolled seizures. We don't want side effects. We want it to be easy to take once a day at most, multiple times a day. It's so hard to remember. Um, we don't want it to interact. We want it to start easily, not take months to get up to a therapeutic level. We want it to be affordable so that our insurance companies will cover it and pay for it for us because everyone can't go broke when we look at the amount we have to pay. Um, it needs to be available in many formulations so a child can take it with a liquid. You know, or it can be put down a tube feeding or it can be given by an IV or a pill or a nasal form. And it has to have a logical way of working in the brain or a way that we can understand so we can try to mimic that and develop even more therapies. So I break drugs into drugs for daily use, which we all need to keep, kind of keep seizures under control, is take them daily. Then there's also therapies that could be used or drugs off and on, and I'll get to that in a minute. Here are a few I wanted to highlight. Aptium is what we call kind of an evolutionary drug. It was based off of or similar uh, to trileptal or oxcarbazepine, but it breaks down into a different metabolite, uh, and it seems to be or is proven to be quite effective. I haven't gotten it in our Medicaid formulary in Massachusetts yet, so I kind of uh, I haven't been able to use it as much as we wish. Um, the interesting thing about here is it's trying to take a product and also make it safer. So the low sodium levels that people experience sometimes with Tegretol or with Trileptal seem to be less of a problem with the Aptium. Ficompa is a whole different type of drug. They call it a revolutionary drug. So it's a new way of looking at developing a drug, acting on a different target in the brain. And then these last three, and I never can pronounce them right, so um, I'll just say the other words. <laughs> well, so it's extended release forms of topiramate or oxcarbazepine. So it's Codexi, Oxtelar, and Trocandi. I think that's the right way to say it, XR. So first, again, on the Ficompa, it's the first one that really works differently on the, on the way that the brain cells get excited. So we want to decrease. Instead of acting on the increasing the inhibition in the brain, we want to inhibit or stop the excitatory chemicals in the brain. And the one that this works on that you might be hearing more of in the future is what we call this AMPA. And it's approved first for partial seizures, hoping that it goes on to generalized forms of epilepsy in the future. These other ones that are looked at the longer acting are done specifically for this slide. If you see, okay, if you see the black form, I'm short, so you might see. So this one means you've got to take a drug multiple times a day. And you see we have a lot of peaks and valleys there. So within one to four hours after you take it, it starts peaking up the concentration. And then over a period of time, depending upon how long it lasts in your system, it goes down again, you take another dose, and it goes up. What happens when you get above the green line? You're at more risk for side effects at that peak. If you drop down below the purple line, I guess it is, you're at more risk for breakthrough seizures. So why do we have to have all that? So a lot of emphasis in, in uh, drug development is looking at drugs that will last longer, extended release, and give us that blue, more stable line throughout the middle. And um, I think that's key for any drug that we develop. But here's my advocacy hat I'm putting on for you right now. There's a lot of insurance companies who try to look at, well, if we've already got um, trileptal on board, 
Why should I pay for a long-acting form of it? So they might you know, force you into using some of the other ones that give you the peaks and valleys and don't control you as well. So as you see new drugs come out, if you say, well, I tried that drug before. I don't think it worked or I had some problems with it. Still go back and talk to your doctor. Talk to your insurance company because maybe it will work better if you can able to keep more stable amounts in your system. And then you're going to need your doctors and nurses to fight for you to get insurance approval if you have a plan. Or use the Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan to do that. So here's, um, I, I get real excited about rescue therapies. These are the as-needed medications. The medicines that for some people, if you have periods of seizures that occur like too many together or too long or in a different pattern than normal, your doctor may have prescribed a medication to use to help stop that cluster. So diastat is a rectal diazepam, which is a form of Valium, that's approved for this treatment of what we call acute repetitive seizures or clusters. Ativan or lorazepam is frequently used, um, and it might be given under the tongue or in the cheek, not in a good form. It's not made specifically for this, and it hasn't gone through an approval process for it. But we know that these benzodiazepines, or the family of drugs that Ativan and, and diazepam or Valium are in, work well to stop seizures quickly. So we have a lot of work going on to look at this. So why, why is this important? Well, you know, acute repetitive seizures or clusters can mean many different things to many people. It could be a change in the number, length, or pattern. Could be breakthrough seizures. Okay? And if seizures go on too long, they can be dangerous. Too many in a row. Could it be dangerous to your brain, but it could affect like Phil's son, where you know, there were times that he just lost whole days because he was having too many seizures going on. Important for you to know that these rescue therapies do not take the place of emergency treatment. If you have a tonic-clonic seizure that goes on five minutes, you need emergency room treatment. You know, they, there are certain things you absolutely have to go to the hospital. But what we want to do is can these rescue therapies help prevent the seizure emergencies? And can they be used out of the hospital? So how big a problem is seizure emergencies? Well, here that tells you the numbers. 90,000 to 165,000 people have these acute repetitive seizures. Um, 368,000 visits to emergency rooms each year. Um, status epilepticus, you can see a quarter million annually. And these are only the numbers that you know about, the estimates up to now. So I am sure it's many, many more. All right, so rescue therapies. What's coming other than with the diastat that we have here? So let me give you a few terms. Buccal means putting it between your gum and your cheek. Sublingual means putting it under your tongue, right? Intranasal means having a form that can go up the nose because we have the inside of the nose has a wealth of, of uh, um, cells that can easily absorb these medications. So any of those would be a lot easier than having to give a rectal diazepam. Midazolam is a drug that normally we know of being used in hospitals by, by anesthetics. Um, but it's also very good at seizures. The question is, you can't be giving it in an IV in your home. So what way can that be given? So that's being looked at by the cheek or the mouth or also underneath the is a injection. The diazepam, we did have an auto-injector of, of uh, uh, diazepam, kind of similar to an EpiPen. But the company that was working on that, I understand, has suspended that work this year. So unless someone else picks up that gauntlet, that's not going to be coming right soon. And then we have the Valium or the diazepam as well as the midazolam being used, looked at nasally. All right, so actually I just already said all this stuff. Anyway, it is a um, benzodiazepine, the midazolam, but it, the, it is faster acting, and the research is suggesting that it can have a more sustained and faster uh, response than the diastat. So buccal midazolam is available in other countries right, by these two formats. And you could get it through a pharmacy that you know, will work with getting it from overseas. But it's still not in an easy to use formulation. So that's what the research in the United States is trying to do. Here's a study that looked at um, midazolam in the nose versus 
Valium or diazepam in an IV to try to see which one might work better. And it, it took children with prolonged seizures, looked at 47 of them who were young, six months to five years old, when they went into the emergency room. And they wanted to look how long did it take to use the therapy and how long to stop seizures. And so I like this graph because it's simple. The red one's the injection, typically what would happen. So it took five minutes to get it. I'm thinking as a nurse, I might, might take longer before they kind of got the injection ready and getting it in. But this is what the study found. And then by eight minutes, they were able to stop the seizure. Um, yet if you look at uh, the in inhalation, the nose, you know, it, they could get it quicker within three and a half minutes and then you know, six minutes to stop the seizures. So either way, you're seeing a faster response of an intranasal route to it. So, and if it can be as effective as the injection, it can be given by IV, I mean, that's the ideal in the hospital. So what we want is the ideal in our home, in our community. This is one that looks just at the Valium or diazepam formulations that can be put in the nose and just to, um, show you what this means. I guess the key point here is it reaches amounts that work. The red is when you give it again through uh, the IV or Valium, and then if you give the, the Valium or diazepam into the nose, you'll see where it crosses the red line. There are two different um, kind of types of the diazepam in the blue and green, but it reaches amounts that can work in under an hour and peaks up within an hour, an hour and a half, but I like the fact that it lasts longer. Those blue and green lines are staying higher than the red line for longer periods of time. And that's what you do is you need protection for longer periods of time. You don't want to have it be protected for just, you know, a couple hours because by the time you leave the emergency room and go home, you might need some more protection. So this slide tells you all these different companies that are actively working on some kind of rescue therapy. So you don't need to know all the different ones, but to, say, to get excited and say, hey, someone's trying to do something that's going to help me at home and not just in the hospital. So I also think about this. My take-home message is that this says that seizure first aid is changing. It's been changing with diastat. It's been changing with the magnet for the VNS. But it's not just first aid. It's responding to seizures. Care and comfort first aid is one part. The next part is the intervention. So if you have seizures for which a rescue intervention is needed, that needs to be part of your first aid plan. Okay, another whole area other than drugs. Can we diagnose seizures and epilepsy better? Why does it take people so long to get diagnosed? So I mentioned earlier about advances in genetics. There's companies working on developing what they call these gene panels. They're actually doing it now to say what can we find, you know, that might highlight, you know, um, genetic concerns. You know, but what really needs to happen is once you know that, can it lead to more personalized medicine? So if you say this person, we've seen X, Y, Z, the question is what does that mean for the therapy? Which therapy would be appropriate for them? So now we look at which therapy might be appropriate by the type of seizures you might have or your age or your sex and a variety of things. This lends another level of information to help choose the right treatment. We also want to detect seizures faster when you have events. It's usually when the events, the seizures are totally uncontrolled that you get into the hospital to monitor them. And then you find out, well, some of those may not be epilepsy seizures, some may. It might be another cause. We want to say, can we detect some of these much earlier? Right? So there's a whole group, looking, many groups, looking at the role of the EEG, the video monitoring, what do you find when you're mapping the brain? Can we find these biomarkers or things in the brain that are going to help us predict seizures? And can that, again, feed into newer treatments? So what... There are some genetic testing that's being done now. I think the gap in what is, is when you do the testing, what does that mean? So it can give in, some of them might give information about your type of epilepsy or some of your risks, but it doesn't yet say, what does that mean for my treatment? Right. So that's where we need to get to. 
So diagnosing and predicting or uh, detecting seizures is critical for staying safe and being alerted to it. So I, I got the, uh, um, you know, the whatever, hourglass to think that. When you're watching someone having a seizure, doesn't it feel like sand through an hourglass? It takes so long. And you feel horrible watching this go on. And typically, when it went a certain amount of time, we'd pick up the old phone. If there were too many, we'd call a doctor. If it was lasting too long, we'd call 911. But now the question is, can we predict or can we see it on the brain on an EEG? And can, so if the brain can detect seizure rhythms, can it then alert someone? So in this case, could it go to a computer screen and alert the computer? Here's a seizure happening, which sends an alert to a cell phone, which collects data in this cloud database. So does that help the person by knowing, how many seizures did I really have? rather than guessing, you know, or not knowing whether you have seizures at night. And can we put some of the power of that data together to kind of better understand some of the epilepsies and how these detection systems will work? So this is a real exciting part in my uh, mind. Repetitive shaking is the most common and kind of first thing that we look at to see can you detect this, and, and that's helpful if you have tonic-clonic seizures or with rhythmic movements, but there's a whole host of seizures that don't have that. We have a couple different uh, systems that go underneath mattresses, MFIT or this MedPage MP5 system. Some hospitals use it. Um, there's not a lot of real good data behind how effective it is. I think the MFIT one's a little more popular. Uh, the MPage, I've looked at two studies, small numbers done in epilepsy units. One says it's no good, the other says it might be helpful you know, in the home setting. So you need to be smart consumers if you want to look at those. I think the more exciting things for use at home is what we talked about earlier, the smartwatch or EpiLert or systems for phones that can, they have accelerometers in it. So I don't have a phone, pretend this is a phone. If it can sense shaking or sense if I fall, that can send a detection, send an alert, contact someone. The video or SAMI system. The new ways of looking at detection that's in progress, looking at heart rate changes, temperature changes, other muscle movement changes that might not necessarily need to be repetitive shaking, but could detect some of the changes in the other forms of epilepsy, the partial seizures, other forms of generalized epilepsy. That's real critical. This is the smartwatch and, and uh, EpiLert that tells you kind of the alert, the wireless lead to a mobile phone. This is a picture of the SAMI system, and, and what I think is just so great, again, is the caregiver, you know? Can it help everybody getting uh, improve their wellness? This is one that's being developed that we hope to see soon by Cyberonics. That will be a patch that could be put on the chest that could record shaking movements, a pulse or cardiac rhythms, and other systems. And so the question here is another alternative way of doing just by putting a patch. Can that help detect and then notify someone of seizures. Now, in addition to detecting and alerting, we have ways of um, trying to provide what we call neurostimulation, stimulate the brain directly. So vagus nerve stimulation, you know, VNS therapy is one that's out and has been used for a long time, and they have in their development kind of pipeline looking at can you deliver stimulation also when changes in heart rate are detected? Because some seizures are, are clearly associated with increases in heart rates early on. So that would be a, a new boon to kind of stimulating neurostimulation if we can get that going. There's a variety of different companies that develop forms of magnetic brain stimulation. I'm thinking one of, it's called TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, where it's an external device that's put uh, outside the brain and you go for a treatment and it, using this big magnet, delivers stimulation to the brain. And it was first started for looking at depression that didn't respond in any other form. And we have one of the early centers for TMS at my hospital and they called me for every group of new people they had to teach them what to do if someone has a seizure because people were afraid that this was gonna worsen seizures or trigger off seizures in someone who didn't have it. So I'm teaching them about first aid procedure in case someone had it. 
But luckily, someone turned around and said, well, what can it do to prevent seizures? And that's where we're at now is looking at, you know, this magnetic brain stimulation, which, again, is, is not an invasive product. So that would be good if we see this down the road. Trigeminal nerve stimulation I spoke about previously. So that's here in some places of the world. We hope to see that coming into our country soon. Uh, the deep brain stimulation. And I wanted to show you a picture of this responsive neurostimulation. Neuropace has developed this. Uh, it was approved, what, last year? and is now uh, hitting a number of uh, places. Do you have it here in Michigan? Mm -hmm. OK. So you'll be seeing that and uh, soon. You already are seeing it. So this is different in that you can place a stimulator. Into, it, it's, it's designed for people who may have a, one or two locations of where the seizures are coming from in an area that you can't operate in. So if it's in your motor area of the brain, you're not going to take out that area of the brain so you can't move. You know, if it's in the language area of the brain. So some areas that you can't move, where you have more than one, so you can't remove multiple areas. But you can put these leads under the skull on top of, as a strip over that area, or slightly under the surface of the brain. And then it's attached in the skull. You can kind of carve out a place in the skull to put this stimulator. It sounds horrible. First time I heard this, I went, oh. But you know, people who have it think it's great, but it, it works. It works similar to VNS in terms of, you know, that it's not a cure-all, but for people, you know, where other things aren't working, for a number of them, it's really worked well. Okay? And so the EEG is there to show you that it learns your seizure pattern. And when it detects your seizure pattern going off, it stimulates. So you don't need to really do anything right there. So that's going to be an exciting thing to see as, as all of you and, and friends in our community see access to this. So we're talking about wellness. You know, we're going to switch to another topic right now. So anybody who needs to stretch, take a deep breath, you know, whatever you need to do, I want everyone to feel well and relaxed while we go into this next topic. So this next topic is going to be something that people might use to relax themselves, marijuana. Believe it or not, I have never used it. My nephews and nieces don't believe me. Yeah. Anyway, um, marijuana has been thought of as a recreational product or, or plant, a drug, over the years. And lots of people have used it that way. And then, interestingly enough, um, a lot of people say that it can worsen my seizures. Some people say it's helped my seizures. But the concern has been there's been animal studies looking at what it does to animals. But the reports in humans have been more anecdotal. And it's fantastic if it helps a few people. But that doesn't tell us how many in this room would it help? What kind of epilepsy would it help? What are the safety concerns with it? How helpful could it be? What would happen when you mix it with other seizure medicines? So all those questions are unanswered. So clearly, we need some controlled trials that will match people using this product against people taking a sugar pill and really find out how helpful is it. This has been an interesting uh, situation that the Epilepsy Foundation has gotten into by really trying to help advocate for access to this for research and to try to address the problems in that in state laws, some states have this legal for use in medical conditions, but epilepsy might not be one of the medical conditions that it's OK to use in. I know in, here it is. In Massachusetts, epilepsy is not on the, the, the list yet for medical marijuana. In any case, um, there are those things. And then we also have a federal law that says you can't cross state borders because marijuana is illegal. So there's a whole host of things that the foundation has been trying to help work on. But this whole interest in this you know, has come from a father, three mothers, you know, a doctor that tried to say, what are these anecdotal reports? You saw probably Dr. Sanjay Gupta do a report on this that really highlighted some of the remarkable things that have happened. That doesn't happen with everybody. So what I'm saying is let's take a step back from that, get excited by the possibilities, but let's get the right work done so we know how many of us could benefit from this. There are a lot of different products in marijuana. Cannabidiol, CBD is the term I use, that seems to be the product that has the most anticonvulsant or the helpful effects for seizures versus the THC aspect, which has more of the psychoactive getting high aspects of, of the drug. 
the problem is that just as a plant, there's all different strains that have different amounts of these products, and how do you know? So we need to be able to get more pure and, and uh, reliable products so you know what's in them. You need to be able to test for them. And then we need to be able to communicate be what people are trying out there versus what is, is happening medically, and then be able to deal with the challenges to the laws. Now, this, a whole talk on this is available on our YouTube channel for the Epilepsy Foundation. But I pulled a couple slides from it to highlight that uh, the U.S. dispensary had cannabis down, which is plant from, from the marijuana, back in 1855 for certain things. And the Ohio Medical Society listed a number of other medical conditions of which epilepsy was on that. And that was back in 1860. So there's, this has been percolating around in different areas for a long time. This gives you a slide. I, I just want to highlight the two boxes. The animal studies here show that the THC, which is the psychoactive part, about 61% of the animals might have this anticonvulsant or helpful effect on seizures, but 30% no effect, another 10% promote seizures. So we know that that's not the best one to do, versus that CBD, at least in animals, about 81% it seems to have helpful effects on seizures and doesn't seem to promote seizures. This I thought was interesting. There was a survey of a Facebook group. Okay? So I, I love technology where it gets us. But a Facebook group of parents for 19 children who were using CBD-enriched marijuana. And they were sharing their concerns because they don't have doctors working with them. They're trying to do it on their own. And so someone did a real controlled survey to kind of say, what are they, what are they telling us that they found? And out of 16 and 19 reported decreased seizures. So it doesn't work in everyone. Only two reported being seizure free. But eight people reported at least an 80% improvement. So there's something going on, at least what people are perceiving for change. Now if you look at what's going on in humans, there's not many controlled trials. So this is four in the past that um, Dr. Chong, who presented in June, and, and if you look under this uh, highlighted area, what you'll see is very small numbers. Nine in the first study, 15 in the second study, 12 and 12. And while some of them, they talk about placebo control tested against groups of people who took a sugar pill, they don't give the numbers of them. So it really tells us there's a, there's a big gap in the research here. It also shows us that the bottom two studies show that there were no differences between those who took a placebo and those who took the, the active drugs. So clearly we, we see the need for more research. We do have a pharmaceutical company, GW Pharma, based out of UK, that has developed a product with the marijuana, the CBD-enriched marijuana called Epidiolex. And they've been doing some open-labeled studies, primarily children with treatment-resistant epilepsy, whether it's a Dravet syndrome, partial epilepsy that doesn't respond, and some other forms. And there's been over, actually it's six plus sites that in the United States that have been testing up to 25 or more people. And the information, hopefully we'll hear more about their results of that, but they're actually, it's interestingly enough that they're starting a randomized control trial this fall, which more people will be participating in to really try to see how effective and in how many people. But this is still in children to start. So if we think about the medical marijuana, you know, and uh, what are some take-home messages? Well, it may well be a viable therapy. But there are different strains of the cannabis, and they have different levels of the THC and CBD, and so just going out and, and smoking, you know, isn't going to help. Getting an oil and, you know, giving it that way, you don't know if it's going to help or not. So the emphasis is on getting the products that will help, and so you know what it is that you're taking. And this story also highlights the power of advocates, of parent advocates, of individual advocates, to say, I have a problem that's not being addressed, and I need someone to pay attention. So let's look at that. OK, so that takes us from the relaxing part of a therapy, <laughs> the marijuana part, to saying, what is health and wellness? Well. We all need to be healthy, and epilepsy is part of us and, and can affect our health in so many ways, but doesn't necessarily mean we're unhealthy in all the ways. 
we do need to think about the role of our help and our fitness and our wellness and our diet and our mood and our stress and how we manage that. On well, How does epilepsy cause those problems and what does that do to our daily life? But how do all those things in our daily life affect our seizures? Throughout the epilepsy literature and throughout all of time, people have known that this is important. I know in nursing care, at your affiliates, the, nurse, the health educators focus on this a lot. Can you identify triggers or precipitants of seizures? You know, so if you're not exercising or you're exercising the wrong way or if you're eating or not eating and certain foods that could be aggravating your seizures, what can you do? That's a form of health and wellness. There has not been enough attention to this. And so we have some of our real researchers helping to look at what can we learn? There's some studies that are showing that people who do exercise to a level that they have greater levels of fitness seem to have less seizures. Is this a cause, consequence? What's the association? It knows we need to look at fitness in a lot more. So the Epilepsy Foundation is creating a new Health and Wellness Institute of the foundation. So I think this is going to be exciting over the next year or so to really see how we bring this aspect out to all of us. So one part of, of kind of wellness is what do we put in our mouth for our nutrition? So we do know that dietary therapies for epilepsy have been around since the early 1900s, um, more popular since 2000. And the ketogenic diet is the main therapy that you know, people think of here. And the Charlie Foundation really brought this to life with uh, some extraordinary documentaries you know, about 10 years ago. And the research on ketogenic diets has abounded since then. What's interesting is we now have different options for dietary therapy. But we're also learning from these researchers that sometimes just improving someone's nutrition, even if they can't get them to stay on one of these stricter diets, has had a significant impact. And that needs a lot more study as well. So these are the different therapies right now. If you look at a specific epilepsy diet, the classic ketogenic diet being the most rigid one, a modified diet makes it a little bit easier to use, different ratios, or they took the Atkins diet and modified that, or what we call the low glycemic. Basically, bottom line is that it takes, they're primarily higher in fat than what your normal intake would be, and you really have to balance the ratio of carbohydrates and proteins and fats. Well, you can say, how easy is it to do? Well, if you're a kid and you're a parent that cooks the food, it's a lot easier. You can tailor it. As you get older and you get food preferences and you're an adult and you're going out to eat, some of these strict diets are very hard to, to stay on and manage. But if you can, I mean, it's similar to many of the other therapies. That you can see 50% or more, some say up to two-thirds, when they use the diet may get control of their seizures that way. Who should try these? Well, we call anyone that has failed at least two or three trials of appropriate medications for your seizure type as refractory or resistant to medications. So if you're resistant to medications, consider your options. Dietary therapy, surgery, with some of the other things, uh, devices. Okay? It could be helpful in some specific epilepsy syndromes. So if you have one of these epilepsy syndromes and medicines haven't worked, you know, some studies have shown that this seems to be more helpful on it. And certain medical conditions, you know, may be more helpful. This is taken from uh, Beth Zupakania, who is the nutritionist and an educator with the Charlie Foundation, who helps educate people kind of worldwide on this. All of these therapies require medical supervision. It's not something that you should just go out and do out your own because you still need your seizures monitored. You need to make sure you're getting the adequate nutrients, all of the types of vitamins and supplements you may need. You see the ketogenic diet, the classic ones, they require very high fat, between 70 to 90 percent, um, and very low carbs. That's the hardest ones to stick to, and that's best for the children where you can control the diet. And then the other diets, the modified glycemic diet, the, modifi the modified Atkins or low glycemic, there's too many words here, yeah, that um, have less percent of fats, a little more liberal on the carbohydrates, and it's easier to find substitutions for the foods. So that flexibility means that it's in greater use for all ages. I just, you know, a lot of people say, I think it's just for kids, it's not for adults. Well, I just want to say that I have a, a person my age, a man who's had 
refractory partial seizures for eons and ends up in our emer in, I in intensive care unit and status or continuous seizures way too often. And, you know, attending epilepsy doctor and I finally said, let's try a diet. And he didn't want to try it because he said, I can't stick to that. But I think it was the modified Atkins we finally got him on. And interestingly enough, we kept him out of, well, first of all, he was only had simple partial seizures, and that was rare for a number of months, you know, or a year. We kept him out of the intensive care unit for about two years. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, these things don't, aren't magic. I mean, they, seizures have come back. We, when he got off the diet, we've had to get him back on it. He still needs medications. But it shows that there are things that can work in different people. So it's worth trying it out. All right. So I've covered topics of devices and drugs and daily ones and rescue ones and all of these things. So let's pull this together and say, what does it mean in terms of what might be coming I could see in the near future? So this epidiolex, or that form of the, the marijuana, or the CBD, let me say it that way, is one that people are hoping we'll learn more about and see more about in the near future as this GW Pharma really works to, on some of these larger trials. But just the studies going on aren't enough. It's going to need a lot more research before it's something that the FDA would approve and there's a lot of legal and regulatory issues to address. There are other, um, there are growers of medical, of marijuana. Uh, out in Colorado, they've tried to isolate high CBD strains, one you might have heard of, of Charlotte's Web, um, but other forms that are being marketed. The problem is you gotta go to the state where it is to try to get it. And so families are moving to that state, some of which are finding it's helpful, and others finding they've moved the whole family and it's not helpful. But um, hopefully things like that might become available. Uh, Cybronics work with the response of VNS, the, the ProGuardian guard to detect it with a chest, uh, a chest patch, uh, hoping to see in the near. In the not so far future, there's a whole list of things here. And just Huperzine A is now made into a drug that is being tested for Dravet syndromes and partial seizures. Well, Huperzine actually came from a traditional Chinese herbal product. So, you know, people say, you know, I don't want to take that prescribed drug. I want something natural. Well, all these things come from somewhere, the substances. And this is a classic example of it. Looking at an herbal medicine that people were using in another country and trying to test, really, will it work in epilepsy and creating a form of which, it, if, it, if this works in the trials, you know, will be available in pill form. Other kinds of, of medications will be coming out, this fenfluramine, uh, but I never can say it. I, we need simpler terms. Dr. Smith, can we come up with easier words? By veracitum, I know I'm saying it wrong. Or other kinds of seizure detectors that can look at changes in heart rate, muscle, or EMG is muscle detection, and as I mentioned earlier, the transcranial magnetic stimulation. That stuff is out there now, but it needs to finish the studies in epilepsy and get approved, so not only can you get it, but it can be approved and you'll have insurance companies pay for it. So none of these are very helpful if we can't access it. So what's far, but maybe we can see it, but it's gonna be a ways. We mentioned earlier about gene therapies. You know, can you do a test, but then can you do something based on that test? So that's far away. What's near is the excitement about it and the people investing the time and energies into really looking at that because we really need to understand the epilepsies better if we're going to be able to then understand the genetics behind it and then how to target uh, the therapies appropriately. So that needs a lot of different work here. What can we do about different cell therapies? Can we turn around and get cells from the brain or specific cells that could help seizures and get them implanted into the brain or into parts of the body where it could help seizures? It's being tried in a number of other um, a number of other diseases. It's actually been tried in epilepsy. I was part of a study that, that looked at some cell parts years ago. Um, but it's come much farther along, so I think that it's gonna be more of a reality in testing now. But it'll be far away before we see something in it. The more personalized medicine, farther away, but hopeful. And then, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of different devices. We hope that these will carry through to fruition. 
none of this would work. We wouldn't be here today without the advocacy and all the voices and the passion from all of you here and throughout the country and the world. Because you bring up the real need to say what epilepsy does to you, does to your loved one, and what you need to make this better. We wouldn't have gotten anywhere with the dietary therapies if we didn't have the Charlie Foundation and Meryl Streep and some of these documentaries that highlight that and bring it into consciousness for everybody. The health and wellness, the same thing. We need to raise that level. People are saying, you know, it's more than just the seizures. It's how the seizures affect my life. If I could help address the stress that it's causing, the physical problems are causing, I would be better. So that comes from all of you. The need to diagnose seizures better comes from everybody here. Who wants to live for 10 years with seizures before you get to an epilepsy center to find out is it epilepsy and what could help me? The safety concerns that people raise to say, you know, Getting control of seizures is great, but more importantly, I don't want to break as many bones and I don't want to be at risk of pneumonia and all of these other things or of dying. So detecting things better and preventing these emergencies and staying safe are critical. So our community, all of you, everyone living with epilepsy in some way, shape, or form, joining together with the Epilepsy Foundation, you are a key driver of this pipeline. It's your ideas that got this started. It's your ideas that will make it work by participating in research, by advocating for research, by helping to fund it. All of that is what drives progress. So all of us can see that you have a hand in this in some way, shape, or form. And for all of us getting better, it depends upon all of our continued work. So there's another area that the Epilepsy Foundation is trying to um, create kind of a new avenue and a new kind of research. And this is called the Rare Epilepsy Network. There's a, uh, I don't know if I'm going to get this right, PCORI initiative, which is patient-centered outcomes research. So it's what are the outcomes that are important to us, to people with epilepsy, to caregivers, to family members, to all of that. And how can we make sure that we're driving that research to reach those right outcomes? So um, this REN network was the initiative that was created by and for people with epilepsy, designed to provide them opportunities to participate in research. And it's clearly patient-centered, patient-driven. So there were seven epilepsy, epilepsy groups that came together initially that drove the development of this pro proposal, heard the government put out the call for the PCORI grants and said, let's do this. They got the Epilepsy Foundation together with them and said, can you help us? And the right researchers uh, at Columbia and the RTI network to really help us do that. So parents, family members, people with epilepsy have been involved from the beginning. This slide just shows you the list of some of the different rare epilepsies that have been involved from the beginning on this. The goal of this is that we're going, they're creating this database that's really tracking people over time, so we're going to understand more about these epilepsies, what works, what doesn't work, and we want to build this to have continued funding past this initial grant cycle that can be sustained and we can grow this network to more and more epilepsies. And this Rare Epilepsy Institute could also reach out and provide better education and awareness and support to some of these epilepsies that we just don't know as much about. But by learning more through research, we can really help people know more about how this affects their life, how to make progress and change. Another critical part of this is that it's creating fantastic partnerships within the epilepsy community. So people are coming together around this and saying, it doesn't matter what hat I wear, it matters what change we can make together. So all of this, I mean, I think, I hope throughout this talk, these three words have resonated for you. Empowerment, that you feel that there's a sense of uh, empowerment, of hope that you're going to get help out of this, that each and every one of us have a role, that we can feel hopeful for the future. I know sometimes when you go to conferences and you're thinking about what's not working right in your life and what the seizures have done to you, it's hard to have hope. 
You're saying, I need a, I need a solution. Um, and some solutions you may learn here today. Many you may not hear today, but you could have hope that people are working on it, and you can work on it to get it to us faster. So I say take charge, get involved with the epilepsy movement to participate in all of this, keep abreast of what the changes are, and help us really end epilepsy, end seizures, and the devastating consequences like SUDEP. So with that, I'd like to thank the Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan and Arlene, uh, particularly, for bringing me here. Um, I left some time for questions or discussion, um, uh, but I know that you have uh, Dr. You know, um, you have a question answer session afterwards so that Brian Smith can answer most of these questions anyway that I've raised. But in the meantime, I did want to leave this open for some question answers at this time or just comments or concerns that you have about er ideas that have happened. Yes, right here. Yeah, smartwatch is on the market. You just go to, to smartwatch or smart monitor, um, and it is some, they've been working with insurance companies, so some insurance companies are starting to pay for it. I write it out for patients, and you can pay for it out of pocket, but then they will take the prescription to their insurance company and see what they can get for reimbursement. There's a basic level, and then there's another level, I, uh, I'm not sure, they called it premium or another term for it, but that has a GPS locator, I forgot to mention that, which is critical, because what do we all want? We want to be able to move around and have some independence. And for so many people with epilepsy, you, you don't have that independence, because everybody's worried about you. They don't want you to go somewhere alone. Well, and part of this is that, you know, if you could go somewhere and you have this, and if you have a seizure, it alerts someone, and they can tell by the GPS locator where you are, they can get to you, or if it looks like it's a seizure that's going on, they can call 911. I've done that for, for people before. And it's let, you know, one of the people I work with continue their running. And if they've had a seizure when they're running, the, the GPS locator finds them. So more and more of these are, I mean, some of the, the phone uh, one that is um, being tested this is looking at that EP detect. It's a beta version right now, and that will go to the phone, and that has a GPS locator as well. Um, that's beta testing, so that's, uh, it shows right on their website how to get it, but that would be need to pay for. The other one, EpiLert, I believe, is, is paying for, but you can get it online and it's available. Is in the middle? Oh. Yes, in the back. I like the idea of the, of the uh, watch and the telephone connected to your phone, uh, connected together. However, has any thought been given to the phone system <coughs> that actually have a security access to them? And how would that work with those? Because uh, I know you can contact, excuse me, I know you can contact 911 directly from there, but you cannot conduct the, cannot connect like the uh, case of emergency number. So That's my question. Uh, to, you mean to connect right to an emergency line? I believe you can put it to an emergency line. You know? That and uh, all of these devices are a little bit differently. I'm, I would doubt that you can connect it right to 911 because 911 would go crazy on that, you know. Um, but you can connect it to emergency contact, which then can get it to you. I mean, as these come about, you would, I, I envision, you know, that you, how many, well, how many of you have someone that's older that you might care for in the home or you worry whether they fall? There's tons of medic alert things where you can push a button and get help. And they can go to a central call system, which then s sends someone there to you. So that's part of, of the whole idea to it. And I'm not sure that we have the devices that are in progress, whether they've gotten that far on it yet or not. But um, that's the ideal, is that you could get to a caregiver or a contact, but then could we actually get to a call center, which could then activate you know, the emergency response, that, that is going to be, I think, part of by being able to get the data um, 
accessible and the high, best technology so we can do that. Because you're right, if, if you don't have anyone to send the alert to, that doesn't work. Yes. about that today. Okay, you can see Arlene. Dr. Smith, do you use the uh, smartwatch at all or any of these? Someone in your center? I mean, so, so I would talk to the foundation and any of your epilepsy centers here today because they can direct you to the sites and to the people who can actually help you get that. So for each of these sites, do your homework. Look at the ones with the most research, read the research on it, okay? Because if you're gonna put some money out of your own, you wanna know that you know it's gonna be something that works, right? But they also, all of them have podcasts on their site that you can look at and then talk to the foundation about it and they can connect you with people who have used it. You know, if you wanna speak to someone that way, as, as uh, Dr. Smith said, he's got people have and I would bet that every epilepsy center around has done that. Yes, in the back over here. If anybody wants to talk to me about smartwatch, we have one for my daughter. There we go. So at lunch, can you stand up a minute so people can see you? There we go. Take a look at her, find her at lunch. Because this is how we help each other. Everyone's got different experiences. So when you find someone that's gone through something that you're interested in, listen to it. Your experience might not be the same as that, but you might learn something that's helpful to you. In the blue dress, or teal, whatever. Any nerves that might not require all these watches and stuff? Is there any new medication? Is there any new advances with app? With I have two daughters that just have apps and seizures, and one has like photosensitive. That maybe a lot of this technology might not be useful for. So great, great question. So in terms of the drugs, I think. Of the pipeline right now, and maybe uh, in the following session they can talk about it, I don't believe any of these drugs under development right now are targeting absence seizures. When you talk about the detections, that is exactly the problem. You need to be able to detect when you don't have repetitive shaking, when there's a change in awareness or some subtle movements. That's the, um, partial, many of the partial seizures are just staring or some automatisms. So those are huge groups, absence seizures, partial seizures. And that's where the technology looking at changes in skin temperature, heart rate changes, muscle activation. So if there's tightening of a muscle, not necessarily shaking, those kinds of things are what we need to try to address some of the other epilepsies. side effects from the meds are so bad that her reading scores have dropped, her ADD has increased. So she's not treatment resistant, but just the meds have so many side effects that they, it, it just is, has me worried. So I, I understand that worry so much. You know, if, if you, know, you think of that initial uh, picture I showed of the drugs, that how many of them are, and gee, that's great, but if we, we have 30 to 50% of people who are still having problems from side effects or seizures, doesn't matter which one, it makes life untenable. And so that's the issue of the need to really push these ideas forward and don't stick with just the major seizures, let's get at these different kinds of seizures so we can target it because the side effects are, are crucial. And can we develop better drugs that won't have all of the side effects? Absolutely. But can we also use non-drugs, some of the devices, the external stimulation? I think it's gonna be interesting and I'm gonna leave this question to the next panel. I don't know if the trigeminal nerve stimulation has looked at absence seizures or generalized forms. I forgot to look that up. But um, you know, some of these other forms you know, the trigeminal nerve, the transcranial magnetic stimulation. Once you get something to market, then we have better ease of trying it in different types of epilepsy to see what helps, or it doesn't help. Sometimes it can make it worse. So, you know, I think those specific treatments are down the pipeline, but clearly, clearly visible. There was there a question in the back, yes. 
Can you stand up, please? Okay, another smartwatch. Perfect. And can I? Can you both stand up? Did you get any insurance reimbursement? No. Do you mind me asking how much it was? So how long ago did you get it? We've had it over a year and a half now. All right, so I looked it up for someone probably three months ago, and it was more in the $600, $800 range. You know, as you improve technology, you can bring price down. That's the marketplace for us. Um, and the more that use it, they can do it. So, um, yeah, it was definitely. Very expensive, but it was peace of mind for me. Peace of mind, job, sure. So. Um, can you give her the mic and let her speak oh. right into it? So my daughter had a generalized seizure in the middle of the night, and we would never have known. So after that, we bought that. It's just peace of mind. I could sleep at night knowing if something happened, like if she was shaking or something. It actually sent a text message to mine and my husband's phone. So it needed a phone to go with it, but then it would send a text message, and then after that, if I didn't like go in there, it would actually call me. The phone would call me. At night, usually at night, because you know she's sleeping and I want to sleep too. So, can we give the mic to the woman behind? Them. Unless <laughs> you'd like to add to any of that. There's also a foundation called the Danny Did Foundation, which will, help, which will help you purchase it and pay for a year. Oh, thank you. I forgot about that. Yes, Danny Did Foundation does help help with some of the finances on that. Oh. So yes, they have changed it now so that you could do it as a subscription, so as a monthly cost. So I'm trying to fit so many things in, I forgot the details of it. It used to be, in the beginning, one flat cost, but now they're putting it into a subscription cost. So um, if you go to the website on it, you can see the differences on that, because that's really what makes it as an affordable, because it might be that you don't need it for a real long period of time. Depends upon how the epilepsy is. So, I mean, that I think has been, the interesting thing about that, it is repetitive shaking, so it's their limitations. The exciting part about that is we've got a company now who is with us, with the epilepsy community, and they're invested in looking at all of these other ways that they can detect seizures. So they're not gonna just stop with just detecting repetitive shaking. They're involved in the research to detect in other ways as well. So I love it when business comes together with our scientists, our researchers, to bring the best and brightest minds and say, where can we take this? Let's not stop here. In the back, can we take the microphone over here? Hello. Oh, okay, you can hear me. Um, yes, we have two children. Um, that have seizures, and they've had all kinds. They've had, the, they've, my youngest son has fallen, passed out, went backwards. Um, he's had the silent, he's had the uh, grand mal or the generalized one, and so my other son has had the silent and the uh, generalized where he, with the convulsions. So they have all, they've had all types of seizures. My question, um, beside the devices, we've heard about the, uh, the, the dogs, and they're so really so expensive. Is there, is there any way that, um, or some type of rescue that we can find a, a dog? I mean, the, the wa smart watch is much cheaper because I've heard the dogs are like $3,000, and we just cannot afford that. It's not in our budget. But um, um, is, do you know anything about the rescue dogs for the um, uh, seizures? So yeah, in addition to just getting the dog and training it, you got to feed them every day too, darn it. But <laughs> no, I'm a dog lover. So um, the Epilepsy Foundation is, is work, working with many of the, oh, I want to say, which group is it? Oh, is Phil here? Pause. Okay. So to really try to help educate more about this and to make things more accessible. But bottom line, it is expensive. There are some organizations willing to help with the expenses of that. Um, if I'm not mistaken, UCB, I think, still has an assistance program on dogs. I better double check that. Um, so some of the, the dog training groups have been doing that, as well as some of our, our partners. But it is, is expensive. So the question raises, 
how reliable are they and do I have to have a specially trained dog or not? So we still don't fully understand what all the seizure dogs do. Some people say that they can help predict. The literature on prediction is very, very sparse. Right? But the alerting response seems to be the most helpful response. So if they detect a change in their owner, you know, the person with seizures, they can respond to help the person stay with them, bark, contact, you know, get help, however you train them to do that. So um, there's, for that reason in and of itself, it can be an enormous boon to it. So you need to, my advice is think, why do you want it? Is it companionship? Is it to help responding to seizures, to alerting to it? If we're looking at just for prediction, I look at all the research real carefully and talk to, to your, your um, epilepsy team about it, of what they know. I know I've referred a number of people just to getting a good dog that they can bond with. And I've seen just as good results. And I know some of the other training groups might not like me to say this, but I've had just as good results with that. Because part of it is that bond. Just as we know our pets, our pets know us. So sometimes uh, getting the right dog through a rescue pond or purebred, whichever kinds, there are certain ones that are good at responses anyway, can be enormously helpful. So I'd encourage you, if you're, if you're interested in seizure dogs, talk to someone who has it, is involved with you know, the foundation here, your epilepsy team, and we can share with you the different information so you can make some good choices. But they can be helpful, but they're not the be all and end all, just like any one thing. Next question here. Yeah, we probably have about time for, yeah, for one or two questions. Okay. Um, hi. I just went on the Google app on my smartphone. Yes. And if you have a smartphone, it doesn't have to be an iPhone or anything, if you go on Google Play and type in epilepsy app, there are seven different apps that come up for free. I don't. Some of them say that they can't track your seizures, but for people who are interested, just go on because I'm pretty sure all the smartphones, Android phones, are linked to Google Play. So go on Google Play and just type in Epilepsy app, and there are seven different apps all for free that come up. Some of them say Seizure Diaries. Some of them say Epilepsy Action. Just read through the apps, and so far, a lot of the reviews are really good. So if anybody was looking for that information, just go on the Google Play Epilepsy apps. And also, real quick, I wanted to say I have seizures, and... I have dogs and cats, and I always had dogs and cats. Two of my cats can tell when I have seizures, and they will sit on me, and they'll put their paw in my face to let me know that I'm going to have a seizure because they can smell the change in your body chemistry. I have also had a dog, just a regular dog, and, uh, you know, people can say what they want, but I've always had pit bulls, and I had a pit bull that would block the door so I couldn't go out the door, and then when I would have the seizure, he would lay across my feet and he would circle around me to let me know to lay down and he would guard me and that's how he knew I would have seizures. So you can get a regular pet and I, for me it's always worked because sometimes they can tell before I can even tell. Sometimes I don't have any warning. So you might just want to get into look into getting a regular dog and let them bond with your kids because once they know your scent, they know before you do sometimes that you have a seizure, so just try to look into a regular dog. It works for me, so yeah, dog and a cat, so that's what I do. Thank you very much. And I think um, in regards to the uh, uh, technology, there are lots of apps there, and uh, like Epilepsy Actions through the UK. There's a, you, most websites are all kind of have some you can access through the internet. So there's a lot of good information out there, but just like for anything looking at the reliability of some of the information out there. So you're getting the reliable information. Um, there are some uh, epilepsy diaries. We have seizure tracker, patients like me, and the epilepsy.com is putting a new version of, of their epilepsy diary It'll be my, um, that will be out in November. So there are a lot of interesting things out there. Um, for those of you who are parents, and that your children with seizures have experienced bullying or have problems making friends. We were just made aware of a 
um, app that helps you know, to teach parents on how to deal with bullying and things with children. Uh, the CDC recommended it, and we just put it on the epilepsy.com site, and they're sending it all out to the affiliates. So it's a lot of helpful tips for parents because that's the social aspect of epilepsy that is just as important. And last thing about the dogs is that each, as, as she just mentioned, there are different responses that are needed. The benefit of the pause for ability, the canine assistance, all of those groups, is that they can do in-depth training to find the right response for you with the dog and teach the dog things that they might not know on their own. So again, it's depending upon what you need and why you need, and specialized training really might be the way to go for your situation versus uh, your household pet, or the household pet might really suffice it. So definitely something that, that people uh, should look into, just like everything that we've talked about today. These are opportunities to make life better for everybody. Thank you very much.